Mobility and transport in our cities are powerful illustrations of the world's current triple crises. The pandemic has brought the movement of people in cities to a hold, hyperlocalizing and virtualizing our activities. The climate emergency is forcing us to recognize that the way we travel across and between our cities has make and break implications for global efforts re-establishing a safe climate. And seeing who has access to the city and who is excluded, or what consumes our streets and what contributes to urban life, makes abstract notions of justice and fairness comprehensible. For urban transport, the early 2020s are going to be an inflection point hard to overestimate. As a result, uncertainties not only exist in relation to future mode shares, but average travel distances in cities, including and beyond travel to work. Are we witnessing the shift towards 15-minute walkable urban districts, utilizing digital connectivity for metropolitan and global accessibility, or the persistence of a physically connected one-hour metropolitan region? Welcome to the third Urban Age debate focusing on localizing transport towards the 15-minute city or one-hour metropolis. The Urban Age debate series is organized by LSE Cities, the Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft, and the LSE School of Public Policy. Today's debate uh, is also kindly supported by SAP and Terralytics. My name is Philip Rode. I'm the Exec Director of LSE Cities, and I will co-chair the next 60 minutes with my colleague Isabel Dedrin, who is Global Transport Leader at Arab here in London. On behalf of both of us, a very warm welcome to our three panelists, Ed Glazer, the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University, Sir Peter Hendy, the Chair of Network Rail in the UK, and Yulisa Kani, Chief Business Development Officer of Transnet, who owns and operates South Africa's rail network. LSE Cities will be live tweeting during the event. If you want to join the discussion on Twitter, the hashtag is Urban Age Debates. This uh, online event is also being live streamed on our Urban Age YouTube channel and will be made available as a podcast and YouTube video afterwards. We are also running a survey on urban transport futures at the moment. And in case you'd like to contribute, my colleagues will share the link with you uh, later on. Now, in terms of the structure of uh, today's debate, we are going to take this in three intense rounds. First, a speculation on the new temporal geography of cities. Second, uh, discussing the question of public transport futures and finance. And third, reclaim the street, the tension between place functions and mobility functions of our urban street environments. Throughout, please make use of the Q&A. We hope to take one or two questions after each round, but adding your views, questions, comments will also help to broaden the perspective throughout as they can be seen by everyone. So let me now begin with our first round, uh, formally the new temporal geography of cities and the tension between hyperlocalization and on the other hand, the metropolitan region. The pandemic has of course forced all of us to appreciate the local scale in our cities, but also allowed us to test how feasible and desirable hyperlocalization is. At the same time over the last two years, we have seen mayors, urban policymakers, and planners that have become quite interested in accessibility in the local level and uh, the issue of the 15-minute city, which is kind of developing quite rapidly as a potentially new paradigm for urban development. Our initial survey on transport futures also suggests that a global group of uh, urban practitioners and thinkers think that there is a considerable uh, likelihood that in the future we will see greater levels of proximity and greater degrees of localization within our cities. Yet at the same time, what does this actually mean then for access across the metropolitan region? Does this matter less, less therefore? What are the transport implications of combining digital and physical access? And finally, what are other trip purposes than commuting that we really have to consider as we move forward? So we have a quick round of two minute speculations now by our panelists. We'll start with Peter, then Yulisa and Ed. Peter, may I invite you to speak first? So uh, thank, thank you. Um, you'll see uh, if you look at my uh, video that I'm an old man and I've been around in, in, uh, in urban transport for a long time. 
Uh, and that doesn't mean that my opinions are right, but they're informed by uh, at least uh, experience. And, and I think um, the, the straight answer to the question, does daily access within metropolitan regions still matter? The, I think the real answer, my answer to that is yes. And, and I think although we've learned to live with uh, this wonderful global technology of having meetings while sitting at home, actually the, the, the psychological uh, and mental effects of it and the desire of people to get out and actually physically be and, 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 and see each other uh, has been only exacerbated by the lack of contact that we've had. Um, and uh, our city, London, or my city, London, is uh, just coming out of a stage at which for the first time we're able to go to restaurants and sit indoors with other people. And people are enormously enthusiastic to do that. Uh, uh, another member of this panel and I have exchanged photographs of ourselves in restaurants in the last 48 hours because we could do it. And I think that's true of work as well. And, um, we, 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 and whilst I, I think that this technology certainly will enable me to conduct meetings from home whenever I choose, um, it's not what I'm going to choose to do. And more importantly, I don't think it's what we as an employer will choose to do or many other people in the city will choose to do. And I think for those reasons, the city centre and the activities in the central business district, whilst they're going to change, are, are, are not redundant. The effect on retail businesses is far more uh, dramatic and, and likely, in, in my view at least, to be far longer lasting because we have learned to be able to buy and have, have things delivered, whether they're food or other things, uh, w w without moving from the house. But so, so what, what does that future look like in, 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 in our business, which is the National Railway Network? It might mean that people access the centre of cities three days a week, not five days a week. No days a week, I think, is stunningly unlikely. Um, but what we might uh, be thinking about is what the transport implications are, not of a system that's full of people at the peak twice a day for every day of the week, but one where actually the peak is only on maybe on Wednesdays or, or more plausibly Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, but certainly not a five day week. And that will cause us to think quite, uh, think very hard about pricing and about the amount of transport supplied. There's just one other thing that I want to say, which is that all our experience in the last 15 months has proved to us that whilst people are, are, are very compliant for, faced with an illness that could possibly kill you for work purposes, all our experience is for leisure, people will pack into public transport and go where they want to go to enjoy themselves. And that's been a really interesting feature. And certainly as far as I'm concerned, we're going to have to think again about the use of national public transport networks for leisure, because if we can't fly to the places that we'd really like to go to on an exciting basis, and many of us won't, won't be able to do that maybe for a very long time, if everybody wants to go to the seaside, then mass transport is a better take them there. Thanks. Thank you. I think, Philip, that's where, where that, I... That, that, that's that's great, uh, Peter, and thank you so much for... Also highlighting already uh, one big uh, question about leisure travel uh, right up front. Let's move to you, Lisa. I, I, you know, I wish I could latch on to the, the last speaker's opening remarks, but let me, let me rather focus on the 15 minute city or a one hour metropolis. I think that's a very noble idea. And for me, it's, 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 it's probably, it's, it's, it's an old target that we've been chasing as cities, but rather elusive for a developing South African uh, city because of our context. And this is a context that might be known by most people on, on, on the conference, but reality is South Africa in particular is still plagued by an apartheid spatial form, characterized by long commutes, multiple connections. You hardly jump from one mode. I mean, you hardly take one mode to, from your origin to your destination, people still, need to make connections, even though we've introduced the bus rapid transit systems with the idea of reducing the, 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 the connections, it still boils down to, to one having to, to, to connect. We also have a, a public transport system that is unintegrated. We're not lacking in terms of supply of public transport. In fact, we probably have an oversupply 
but it's unintegrated. You know, you, 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 you don't have a seamless and an integrated ticketing system either. And, and of course, with an ever growing uh, urban, uh, urban sprawl. And again, when I, when I looked at the reasons why we, we still stuck in the old world of 25 years ago, which is uh, pre uh, the apartheid era, it's not for the lack of policies that would enable us to change our special reform. I guess it's a case of the unintegrated fashion in which the three spheres of government operate. You've got a national government, you've got a provincial government, you've got a local a government, and the bulk of the work sits actually at a, at a local level. But be that as it may, I mean, that's something that we'll probably unpack later. So th therein lies our problem. But I just want to delve into the latest National Household Travel Surveys that we released uh, late last year or, or early this year, I can't remember. On average, commuting in South Africa is 76 minutes. It takes 107 minutes to commute by train. It takes 84 minutes to commute by bus, 64 minutes to commute by taxi, which is the most popular door-to-door -door and informal service, and 49 minutes uh, by car. So I, I guess for me, if you were to give me a target of an hour, I'd be more than happy to pursue that as opposed to the ideal of a 15 minute co uh, commute. Of course, I mean, uh, uh, having experience being uh, uh, operating under COVID-19 regulations, a lot has changed. But to the previous speaker's point, we all are dying to go out there and start again uh, with commuting and and doesn't matter how long it is, as long as you're outside of your, 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 your home environment, which has become your office. But be that as it may, I'm hoping that there will be valuable lessons learned uh, for, for whatever uh, we've, we've gone through, but also use the time to play catch up and see what, what new ways of doing things can we learn. I certainly have a view that even though people are yearning and dying to go back to the offices for a lot of people, because traveling in South Africa is a little bit costly, uh, the Moving South Africa says uh, commuters shouldn't spend more than 10% of their disposable income on public transport, but their reality is it's anything from 25% to up to 40%. So I guess this is a much needed relief from people's pockets. Uh, instead of spending that money on public uh, uh, transport and commuting, they're spending it elsewhere, I suppose. But those are just my, my opening remarks, uh, Philippe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yulisa. Uh, very helpful to appreciate uh, a context that's different from the European and North American, where costs for travel are enormous. Uh, both in terms of time and actual uh, money and household income shares. Uh, we'll come back to this, but Ed, over to you, your speculation. Thank you, Philip, and it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, there are aspects of the 15-minute city that are praiseworthy. I yield to no one in my embrace of the pedestrian city, uh, of walking as being the best of all, of all possible modes. I yield to no one in my belief that City should be freed from the business regulations that make it difficult to start small shops in residential neighborhoods and to bring in exciting cafes, the fruits of urban entrepreneurship anywhere. But the basic concept of a 15 minute city is not really a city at all. It, it's a concept of an enclave, of a ghetto, of an isolated neighborhood. All cities should be archipelagos of neighborhoods, but those neighborhoods must be connected. Otherwise, they are not places of opportunity. Otherwise, a child or a young man living in, let's say, the township of Alex in Johannesburg cannot get to his job in the Rosebank Mall. One of the things that we've discovered about life in, in American cities over the past 20 years is that while they are engines of opportunity for adults, they are dead ends for children. And uh, we see this very much in the upward mobility data that my colleague Raj Chetty has put together, that people who live, children who grow up in cities end up doing much worse than, than children who grow up outside them. One explanation for this difference is that an adult doesn't live in a 15 minute city. An adult wakes up, a, a poor adult, a low income adult wakes up in their, their you know, small apartment and then they go to a job somewhere else. They find opportunity with people who are wealthier, with people who are better educated. They find possibilities. The child lives in a 15 minute city. The child lives in their housing project. They go to their highly segregated school. They live in a world that is no more integrated than a poor rural village. That's what I see. That's what I hear when I think about a 15 minute city. Right? I think about a world in which the rich have isolated themselves from the poor and the poor are cut off. 
The view that we can then duplicate real movement with uh, virtual movement is a fantasy for less well-educated members of this world. If you look at the share of Americans who were working virtually, working via Zoom in May of 2020, 70% of Americans were like us right now, doing our work over Zoom, were teleworking. 5% of Americans without a high school degree were working via Zoom. This new virtual world, if we allow it to persist, is one that is even more unequal than the, the past 30 years of inequality. And so ultimately, I think the right thing is, to, is that while we should praise the good elements of the 15 minute city, the idea of accessibility, the idea of using less driving when we can, perhaps embracing congestion pricing in the US, which I've long advocated, uh, reducing the on-street parking requirements, but ultimately we should bury the idea of a city that is chopped up into 15 minute bits. We must embrace connection post COVID. We must embrace a re-emergence of the whole city of humanity that is connected, not just with the people next to you, but with all of, of our metropole, of all of the world. Because ultimately that's what we've learned, I think from this COVID period, that in fact, all of us are in this together. And if we're gonna make sure that this never happens again, we're gonna to work together. And we need to also particularly work in a way that enables those people who start with less to connect to the rest of the city. Thank you, Philip. Ed, thank you so much. A lot of uh, passion and a very clear direction of, of, of thinking about this. And uh, most importantly, not uh, the obvious point about jobs, but highlighting that uh, children, those in need uh, for education, actually uh, risk being locked in if we really think about uh, the 15 minutes uh, too literally. Um, Isabel, can I just get you in here with uh, observations uh, across our statements and maybe also what's emerging in our Q&A? Okay, um, yeah, I think there's a point there in the Q&A which is around, you know, inclusion, accessibility. I'd be interested in the other panelists' views on Ed's point there around 15 minute city as a kind of risk fundamental restrictive concept rather than an enabling concept. I don't know, Yulisa or Peter, if you'd have a view on that. Well, well I, I, I agree. I, 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 think, I think the prospects of, of creating further inequality by trying to uh, uh, create enclaves of different sorts of people. I mean, the, just I can't imagine from, 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 from the British perspective how you might <clears throat> possibly create a planning system that put into 15 minute uh, areas of the city the, the diverse nature of, of the population in a way that would create equality. And I think I think that Ed's absolutely right, which is that the danger is that what you create is a, is a very large series of walled enclaves for the rich and huge deprivation for the poor. And, 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 and actually, um, but, but the whole thing seems to me to be unfeasible simply because cities grow uh, cities grow up alongside their transport networks and certainly fixed transport networks create a longevity of the design of the city, which is implausibly uh, uh, unlikely to change in the very, you know, simply because city planners or, or city mayors have a, oh, we'll have a 15 minute city idea. I, yeah. I just don't see that, but I agree with Ed that I don't like, I don't want to see it either. So let, let, let's hear from Yulisa. This is a context, think of uh, Johannesburg, but even Cape Town, which is quite movement intense. It requires large parts of the population to access jobs over great distances. We heard about the time and also the money being spent on that movement intensity. Yulisa, are, are you equally passionate about seeing the enormous risk of uh, sort of being a bit more uh, maybe rash, not rationing, but being a bit more um, sort of optimizing in terms of the distribution of urban functions so we don't have to travel that much? Or would you also warn heavily against any form of reducing uh, the mobility and the enormous amount of movement that is made possible through our transport systems in cities? Yulisa. Thanks, Philip. I mean, let me answer this in this fashion. Accessing a city in South Africa is not a matter of choice. It's a matter of survival. And unfortunately, I mean, cities typically in South Africa are an agglomeration of economic activities. If you want to survive, you have to be in the city center. What that has done, however, is that it has put the cities under pressure and government is forever responding to the infrastructural demands as a result of rapid 
uh, urbanization, it does, it's a good thing, you're right. People must be able to access jobs, they must be able to access education, they must be able to access health facilities. What that does, however, it strips the, the, the rural areas off the basic infrastructure, right? So it doesn't matter how much you want to be in a rural space because you like the peacefulness and whatever it comes with it, there's no way you're going to survive in that kind of environment. That's point number one. Point number two, which I found extremely interesting and I thought it was a lost opportunity. When we went into lockdown level five, we, when essentially we were locked into our homes and nothing was, 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 was working, the township economies were not allowed to, 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 to thrive. They, they were literally locked down just like the rest of the, of the country. However, if you're, an urban, in, you're in an urban environment, you could go online and buy your groceries. The person in, in the township still had to travel some distance to get their basic uh, um, amenities or, or whatever needs, the daily needs that they have, as opposed to allowing the townships to self-sustain and self-contain. That's the one thing we've missed as, as South Africa, allowing township economy to thrive. The focus is always in, in the citizen, I understand, but to what end? Are people going to be running away from these rural areas just, just for basic survival? So for me, it's a precarious balance. And, and the reality is that people will want to look for better opportunities, but it should be by choice, not as a matter of, of survival. We have what we call a, a, a global city region where you know, the planning of, of, of our special reform in Gauteng in particular extends further outside of Gauteng itself. It goes towards the Northwest, which is our mining town and goes towards the South, which is um, Sassel Bay, where you find a lot of uh, gas uh, production and, and, and all of that. I guess the aim of that is actually to tap into the labor market, but because of the distances, it's, it's quite difficult to connect at the three, but it's, 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 it's an, another noble idea. But just to close up, I, I think for me, it's a, it's a precarious balance. We shouldn't, we shouldn't invest in one at the expense of the other. That's all I'm trying to say. And people must have the choices and yes. not be stuck because you've got no options or alternatives. Thank, thank you, Yulisa. And that also resonates what's coming up, uh, through the, the Q&A, uh, highlighting you know, that in some ways we are setting this up as an artificial polemic. It's either the one hour metro region versus the 15 minute city. And there's a lot of uh, mutual connection and they can of course work together. If we accept that movement will be important at the metropolitan scale, we need to think about public transport. Very hard. Over to Isabel for the second round. Okay, so we're already behind schedule. So we're going to try and like be even, you know, more brief in our statements. So the second sort of topic we wanted to cover was around public transport futures and finance, and especially the whole business model of public transport, you know, arguably already creaking before COVID arrived, uh, because of the pressures on ridership, uh, the pressures that are created by new mobility providers, uh, taking ridership away from public transport in some cases. So is there an opportunity Ed, you talked about congestion pricing earlier. Does COVID create an opportunity for us to accelerate the rethinking of how we pay for public transport um, and how we finance that, uh, whether that's new tax methods, whether that's changing the subsidy approach, whether that's roping in the new mobility providers to help pay for the assets that they're using every day. Uh, and first on this one, a couple of minutes from you, Lisa. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. Let me, let, me, let me start by saying that if you look at our fiscus, the allocation towards public transport in South Africa is probably about 5%. And this is not to say that public transport is not important, but there are other pressing needs. Uh, there's human settlement, there's water and sanitation, there's electricity. And I guess uh, public transport becomes, we're so used to the fact that we pay more than, than we should, point number one. If you look at that allocation, it goes towards the newly built bus rapid transit systems. That's fine, but you need to make an assessment of whether BRT is working in South Africa. And my point is, it's working to some extent, but you need to get to a point where you are saying it actually should not have been rolled out in 10 or nine cities in South Africa. It's just not working. We were supposed to be running BRTs by 2010, which was uh, the launch of the FIFA World Cup. Only three cities are currently running uh, BRTs 10 years after the, the World Cup came and went. So that money could be channeled 
somewhere towards public transport as opposed to infrastructure development on the BRT. I'm not saying do a shady job and, and don't give people the you know infrastructure for, for, for commuting, but not to the extent that it costs to implement a BRT system in South Africa. I want to highlight two things. You speak about uh, 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 urban uh, 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 road, uh, what, what? Congestion charging or road pricing. Congestion charging, that's the word, sorry, uh, my English ran away there for a second. Congestion charging, congestion, user shall pay principle is okay. But in a country where people don't have an alternative, the Gauteng Freeway Improvement Scheme failed dismally. People are refusing to pay for, 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 for the system. So it's, it's become a huge debt for government to take care of. For obvious reasons, people are saying, I don't have an alternative. If I could use a public transport, I would, but I'm being forced to be on the free and commute long distances and you want to charge me for your own failure. So I guess there's a context to what works in a different city. I, I would certainly say that if you look at, again, one last example, the fuel levy, the bulk of the fuel levy is ring fenced for the road accident fund, which is the fund that is used for compensating road accident victims. Have a look at that and ask yourself, should we not be focusing on preventing road accident, which means that we look at alternative forms of people commuting as opposed to spending so much money on compensating people for something that we should be having under control in the first place. So I guess with the limited budget that we have, there could be a better allocation of it towards the public transport system, as opposed to the road system and other things that are not giving, or, or from which we are not deriving the best value in terms of servicing our commuters and our citizens. Yeah, so it's looking at it in the round rather than sort of often we look at the funding from a piecemeal perspective, mode by mode. Ed, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make three major points. The first of which is, it feels as if for the first time, perhaps in a half century, that in fact, transportation is again changing, that we are having actually important changes in transportation technology, the rise of autonomous vehicles, uh, Hyperloop, various other things, which may actually have, have a major difference. Whereas I think for many of us, I mean, I'm, I'm 54 years old, uh, the transportation that I take now is not very different than the transportation I take uh, when I was born 50 years ago, which was incredibly different than the difference between 1967 and 1917 or 1913, right? So we've had a very slow period. And I think because of that rapid change, it makes sense to keep flexibility, to uh, allow the future to catch up with us and to uh, enable our cities to embrace the new technologies as they come along. But again, following up Ulysses' very wise comment that don't do it in nine cities at once, experiment, evaluate, uh, use the wisdom that comes with experience. Um, second point I, I wanna make is on the, the means of paying for it. I believe very strongly that most of the time, something like user pays is right, um, particularly for anything involving middle income or wealthy people, right? I think the idea that you're going to subsidize people to fly in and out of John F. Kennedy Airport with general tax dollars is a, an absolutely terrible idea. Sometimes because the marginal cost of a service is so much lower than the average cost is in the case of some rail, it makes sense to figure out creative ways to do user cost uh, pay, paying. My favorite example, of course, is Hong Kong's MTR model, where they build large scale real estate developments on top of train stations. And effectively, the real estate development subsidizes the rail, which is a, a beautiful way of keeping the rail price low while still having functionally the users uh, still pay for, pay for things. Um, the, um, there are cases in which that's very difficult. I think, for example, the idea that you're obviously going to want to subsidize buses for, for poor people, that feels absolutely completely right to me. In the context of South Africa, I think one of the great challenges is that you often have two technologies coexisting. One, a technology for the rich, the other a technology for the poor. So for example, in Johannesburg, you have the Gau train, a sleek, fast, modern rail service coexisting with uh, jitneys, with minibuses that are crowded, often unsafe, and wait till they're packed to take them. And the question is, should you be trying to make the rich technology available for everyone? Or I think probably more sustainably, should you be trying to upgrade the current poor technology? Should you be integrating the minibuses in a system which makes sure they're scheduled together, that they work more seamlessly with other modes, that they're safer, which is something of the model that Istanbul followed, I think about 30 years ago when it, when it followed. And I think in many cases, you wanna think more about the upgrading the, the poor system, the system for the poor, rather than just trying to move everyone to something that happens to work well in, in Paris. Third point on congestion pricing. So again, I'm, I'm following Ulysses' point on this, but uh, there is no substitute 
for actually doing something that, that functionally taxes carbon. You can't just subsidize alternate uses of transportation and hope that it'll work out. You need to do something that actually limits people's incentive to actually fly or drive. And that really requires something like congestion pricing. It certainly doesn't require anything that involves subsidizing driving. Right? It certainly doesn't require you know, using general tax revenues to pay for highways or having free parking requirements of all things. But at the same time, and, and that's in some sense the genius of what Ken Livingston did, oh gosh, it must be 20 years ago in, in, in London, uh, of combining congestion pricing with an embrace of public transportation and sort of making sure that the congestion pricing revenues went to enable people to ride on, on the bus. Because in fact, if it's done right, congestion pricing means that the rich people pay right, to make the, the commutes faster and more comfortable for the poor. And that's ultimately what the sort of bargain that we're trying to get to here is one in which you aren't particularly penalizing poorer uh, people, but you're enabling them to take public transportation, which has been made both faster and more comfortable because of congestion pricing. Thanks very much, Ed. And I think that point you're making around kind of trying things and flexibility, which is something as an industry we're not very good at in, in transport is we kind of pick something and then we're going to really throw ourselves into it rather than sort of trying things, developing, evolving more organically. And maybe there's some lessons there in how we fund things as well. Peter, over to you. So, so I've got five points, really. Uh, I think the first one is to say this, uh, the, 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 the obvious point, which is transport isn't an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And both the money spent on building the infrastructure and the money spent on operating it is not because people just want to travel per se. It's because the result of that uh, mobility creates, uh, creates economic value uh, and, and wealth. Uh, and in particular, certainly in Britain, we've seen that um, uh, very recently because the government has spent an enormous amount of public money keeping bus and train services running with very few people using them. They haven't done that because innately run, running buses and railways is a good thing. They've recognised that the movement of the relatively small proportion of the population who needed to move during the pandemic was so valuable to the economy and society that it was worth putting the money in to, uh, to allow, allow them to travel. Um, uh, the, the example of Hong Kong uh, is, 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 a, is a brilliant one because actually, uh, as I just said, transport doesn't exist on its own. And in fact, the consequence certainly of transport infrastructure, but also transport services uh, and, and, and roads is that is that property values are affected. And of course, the significant thing about the Hong Kong MTR, just as Japanese Railways East and, and, and uh, other uh, transport companies that allegedly make money is that they're not transport companies at all. They're property companies with a transport arm. The MCR is a developer that runs a metro, and 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 it's and it's a very sensible thing to do. Sadly, British law explicitly prevents it for some reason that's entirely unaccountable. Uh, and uh, in London, prior to 1933, the Metropolitan Railway started an estate company. Uh, it didn't make much money running trains, but it made a lot of money turning farmland into uh, Edwardian housing in in outer London. Uh, but my uh, my predecessors when I was at TFL in London Transport were explicitly prohibited from doing that. So the value of turning that land into something more valuable uh, accrued to the developers with relatively low taxation rather than the transport company. Uh, if you fix that, there's a lot you can fix uh, beyond it. Uh, the fourth point is about fares. And, and all too often, and Isabel and I have both been uh, in this space, um, city mayors and, 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 and polit politicians think cheap fares are a good thing. They're a re remarkably blunt way of giving poor people uh, access to, to transport, especially in an era when you wouldn't know whether my card tapped on a, on a card reader uh, allowed what fare I paid compared with somebody who had a third of my income. And I, I think one of the challenges that we have to address sooner or later in transport is that if we want fares income for whatever political or, or economic reason to form a significant part of the operating costs of public transport, then we better do something about the fact that the income of the people who are paying fares is extremely unequal. And it seems completely extraordinary to me, you know, the cheap fare policy of the current mayor of London, for whom I no longer work, at least not in transport terms, uh, has afforded people who travel long distances on London's public transport a much greater discount than the poor people that he intended 
should should get relatively cheap bus fares. Um, and the fifth point is is absolutely self evident, and and it's already been mentioned by everybody, which is that charging for road space is quite an obvious thing to do. And in fact, in the post COVID environment, certainly in 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 in, in Britain. It's an even more obvious thing to do because whilst public transport usage is well in London this morning, as my old friends at TfL sent me the information, bus use is at 60% of pre pandemic levels, the railway is about 35 or 40%. Uh, road, road, road traffic volumes are at 93%. So, and, and, unless we go back to something that looks uh, 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 very significantly like normal we might wind up in a situation with less public transport usage, less fares income, the economics of public transport being worse, but greater congestion. You can't see any greater solution staring you in the face, at least if you're anything but, uh, but, but a, a, a nervous politician, than charging people for road space. And, and, and this, this debate really isn't going to go away, um, what, what, whatever the city looks like. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And I think that actually kind of leads into the next part of our discussion. Um, and maybe we can bring in because quite a few of the comments in the Q and A are sort of relating back to the planning aspects in the fifteen minute city. And maybe this sort of third bit, which is around reclaiming the street, as as Phillips dubbed it. You know, the whole place versus movement function. And as you know, many of us on this call know, it's extremely you know politically fraught to talk about even one square meter of road space. There's a perception that it's a zero sum game. You know, if he gets it. I don't get it. Um, is there a way to break through that? Isn't that just going to get worse under the circumstances you've just set out there, which is more and more pressure on, you know, imbalance in which modes are getting the uh, movement on them, too much on the roads, arguably in private vehicles, not enough on public transport, the pressures created by new mobility providers, but also the opportunities created by new mobility providers, the sort of, you know, belief that, uh, you know, if only we provided safe cycling for everyone, then everyone would cycle and no one would ever get on any form of transport ever again, which is, uh, you know, common in some quarters. You know, how do, how do we think about the reclaiming the street agenda, this sort of place movement thing, you know, calmly, in a context where there's so much pressure on the fundamental business model of movement in cities in particular, and in public transport more generally, feels like maybe people will wanna pull back from that rather than kind of step into it. How, how do we find that balance, Ed? So there's no question that the that the COVID crisis has made the pressure on the streets much worse. I, I'm told that you know traffic congestion in Brooklyn has never been as bad because people aren't aren't taking public transportation the same way that they used to because of fear. I, I think that raises a larger issue, which is uh, the COVID pandemic has been in some sense an attack on our urban life, right? It has reminded us that while there are many assets that come with cities. Right. Cities give us a, a, the ability to share, to connect, to learn from one another. They've been enabling chains of creativity since Plato and Socrates bickered on an Athenian street corner. But they also come with considerable downsides with the demons of density. And the most terrible of these uh, is, is contagious disease, right? Which from the plague of Athens in 430 BC to the plague of Justinian in 541 CE uh, down to the cholera epidemics of the mid 19th century, they have been troubling our, our cities. We've had a blessed century uh, of plague-free existence since the 1918, 1919 influenza pandemic, but we have been reminded it, is, it has not been nearly as bad as it could have been. Let us make sure that our governments heed this warning and don't let this happen again. This requires a much more serious approach to pandemic, and that is actually the most important thing. Before the streets can properly be reclaimed, we need to actually be making the kind of investments in public health I've argued uh, elsewhere for uh, essentially a NATO for, for public health, a NATO against pandemic. Um, not rather than the WHO, but, and that's really the first and most important step uh, to reclaim the streets. I, I think, you know, there's no surefire recipe against cars, but a healthy embrace of congestion pricing is clearly a good place to start on this, and a recognition that we can allocate more space to, to pedestrian tra travel. That's, that's also great. But at the same time, we must heed Sir Peter's warning that we need mobility. Right, we cannot think that there is any future in 15-minute enclaves. Right, this is a this is an urban dead end if ever there was one, and we need to make sure that people can access the wonders of the city, can access the cornucopia of joys and of people that exist throughout the particular urban area, and we particularly need to make sure 
that we enable people who grow up, who live in poorer parts of the city to access jobs in richer parts of the city. And there is nothing more important than that. And the view that, you know, somehow or other we're improving accessibility as one of the comments in the chat did by enabling people to zoom in, right? We're breaking down sort of barriers. It could not be more completely wrong. If we make the way to access jobs be through the internet, we are locking out an entire third of the American population that is unable to do that, that is unable to manage the, the technology to make that happen. And I cannot imagine a world that is more unegalitarian than a world that has eliminated real face-to-face -face urban connections and tried to replace them with virtual links. Thanks very much, Ed. Peter? Uh, so I'll be quick. Uh, we've already discussed road pricing. It is the obvious way of rationing uh, road space. And uh, uh, although, Isabel, you and I were there 20 years ago when Ken Livingston introduced it in 2000, uh, 2003, um, politicians are still afraid of it, but it is the obvious thing to do. Uh, and and uh, I think I think the, the pandemic, as it says, it, it, it's right. There will be a renewed emphasis if it comes to pass. The congestion is even worse than it was before. The second point is that this isn't just a transport issue. Again, it's a city planning and 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 uh, built environment issue. And one of the answers to it, paradoxically, is density. If the city is dense enough. You do, you don't think of using private transport. And, and although I'm not sure, uh, as Ed, I, I'm, I'm critical of the 15-minute city concept, in fact, if the city's dense enough, there are many places that you can walk to um, because there's so much going on. And whilst that doesn't give you a complete 15-minute city, I mean, one of, one of the obvious things to do is to move away from low-density development in, on the outskirts of, uh, of, of cities of several million and, and go back to density. And oddly... The retail revolution, which uh, I mentioned to start with, which has barely been mentioned, but re retail as a, as, a, as a whole activity, uh, it has been devastated and will not recover. So there's a real opportunity in the centre of many cities to repurpose valuable land for, for uh, high density living. Uh, and I think successful cities will, will, will do that. And then the last thing I'd just like to say is that inevitably it, it, it is political. And some of the voices are very shrill and very loud. Uh, now that I don't have to deal with them anymore, um, I'm not. I'm not very keen on the cycling community. I think. I think it's disproportionately male. It's disproportionately middle and upper class, and it's disproportionately noisy. And one of the consequences in the city in which I live, not the one I run transport in anymore, but the one I live, which is London, is that my bus journeys are slower and less reliable because many fewer people have got faster and safer, safer cycle journeys. And that really has to be a matter of politics. It's an observation of mine, but actually bus users are not as vocal as, 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 um, as middle-class male cyclists. We'll see how that changes, um, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a fact just now. Thanks, as well. Thank you very much, Peter. Philip, did you want to come in with some observations there? So yeah, before we come to Yulisa on, on the same point, uh, it's really interesting what we're seeing in, in the Q&A coming up. Uh, Camilla Anderson, going back to, I think an earlier point, Ed, you made about children and, and equity and having access, but then the trade-off of also uh, having seen, of course, uh, a reduction in quality of life and opportunities to bond, connect, socialize because of the deterioration of the public spaces. Uh, the sort of overemphasis of the movement function. Um, and then also Johannes Fiedler, who is uh, saying, you know, be, be again a bit more precise. What, what, for what kind of trip purposes are we talking about 15 minutes? For what others, i.e., you know, education and maybe the job is, of course, the metropolitan scale important. But just having listened to both of you, uh, Ed and, and Peter, we're coming out of an era where clearly we have overemphasized mobility and movement as a mechanism of accessing opportunity. Uh, and we have, in many instances, sacrificed very good urbanism in the spirit of prioritizing movement. And the way, and this is the discussion about the street space, it's just plain obvious what has happened here. And we are regretting it, and most mayors are now seeing opportunities of reintroducing other more localized uh, uses of our streets rather than just having sort of the movement function being celebrated. 
Yesterday, the OECD published an estimate what is going to happen over the next 30 years in terms of transport intensity and you know, business as usual. Of course, we will double the amount of kilometers we travel per year. Uh, a lot of this may happen in our metropolitan regions, but is this really the trajectory we feel comfortable with uh, because we are so confident that it leads to those social benefits which Ed alluded to and that we cannot, we really cannot use alternative forms of access, I think is such an important question when we then start designing the street spaces uh, of the future. Uh, back to you, Isabel, and then we'll uh, bring in, of course, uh, the uh, Yulisa with the South African. Yeah, let's just get Yulisa's perspective and then we can look at the chat again. Yulisa? Thank you so much, Isabel. I mean, COVID-19 has highlighted what we already knew in South Africa, which is one, uh, inequality and um, added to that was obviously the digital divide that, that we saw. Whilst some people could work from home, some people didn't have internet connection. While some kids could uh, learn from home, uh, hundreds of thousands of kids in South Africa dropped out of school as a result. But I, I also think that it gave us an opportunity to kind of just pause a little bit and reevaluate uh, the plans. But I wanna go to some very important stats that I want to share with you. 17.4 million South Africans walk all the way to their destination. 10.7 million use taxis, and this is the only mode of transport that is not subsidized. 6.2 million use cars and Metro was at 1.65 pre-COVID and it halted to a grand standstill uh, during COVID. So for me, it's a no brainer to say, hang on a sec, where, where, where should we be investing in terms of, of mobility? As much as, I mean, probably in a, in a European context, there's enough cycling pathways that you probably, you know, are of the view that, you know, people can still get by. In South Africa, there's, there's little to none. The little opportunity, window of opportunity we had for people to be able to cycle was when we're introducing the BRT system. So at the same time, we, we kind of invested in, in public transport, I mean, in, in, in pedestrian walkways, but only in as far as the BRT route, nothing, nothing beyond where that route uh, terminated. Another missed opportunity, but I, I, again, for me, the, the statistics are actually dictating to us where our next investment uh, should be. That's just my view. It's probably going to be the cheapest way of allowing people to be mobile in South Africa. But I, I agree with the view that there are South Africans who cycle for leisure, but for some, it's, it's truly a means uh, to an end. Another missed opportunity I'd like to highlight in, in South Africa is densification and uh, uh, transit-oriented development. We failed dismally. Not that there wasn't an opportunity uh, presented to us by the uh, how train as well as the BRT system, but I found that it was easier for government and its policies to allow developers to build around the how train stations, which were mainly in the suburbs, but not so much in the BRT system, which runs in the townships. It's the same concept. One is a bus, a rapid bus uh, system, and the other one is a is a metro uh, or a rail system. So I guess I'm I'm saying there's a lot of opportunities that government has missed, and we've missed an opportunity to generate proper revenue there that could be ring fenced for, for, for public transport. Another sore point for us, I guess, is the subsidization of the minibus taxis. Uh, BRT primarily was meant to do that, but again, we don't have enough money to roll out BRTs throughout the country. We don't even need that. But the question is, if it takes the lion's share of uh, public transport, how then do we subsidize the public transport commuters that are using that mode of transport. It's a, there's so many uh, studies that have shown that it's, 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 it's an absolute necessity and maybe we're just struggling with the how, but um, it's again, another missed opportunity from, from, from our end. Just be interested quickly, so there's a lot of interest in the 15 minute city in the, in the chat and sort of, you know, is it a good thing, at one level, is it a good thing or a bad thing? And I think the way Camilla's put it there, you know, it's about saying people want to be able, you know, can we enable people to do the things they want to do within 15 minutes from their house, as opposed to you can't leave your the 15 minute zone. Um, 
Yeah, coming back to COVID briefly, you know, a lot of people have said there's been a you know radical reduction in commuting and a big increase in people moving locally. Is that an opportunity? You know, that's a threat in some ways for the public transport network because it's been built up around the idea of pumping the heart of the city. Um, and if that is sustained, then there needs to be a fundamental rethink of the public transport network design and also business model. You know, is this a permanent shift? Is it not? There's been a lot of discussion about that, um, but you know, given how illustrious this panel is I'd be interested in people's views on you know is COVID an inflection point in terms of how people move in cities whether that's from a 15 minute city perspective or any other perspective or do you see this as being you know that was a moment in time and broadly we're going to go back to the way we were before I don't know whether one of you would want to comment on that Peter you yeah, your mouth so I'm, well, I, I'm, 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 I'm just thinking the one big permanent change that seems to me to to have been have happened and be irreversible is the retail change you, you know but certainly in britain uh, our, our city and town centers the retail environment will never return the retailers themselves have, have have gone out of business and 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 that does seem to me to be a permanent change employment i think employers are still trying to decide what to do leisure there will never be a a, a, a big art gallery within 15 minutes of of my house i'm going to have to go to the center of the city for that and i'm looking forward to it and i'm looking forward to going to a restaurant afterwards and having a walk around the city but retail re retail is re you know if if philip if you want to look at the next big thing trying to work out what replaces retail uh, as both the focus of people's attention in town centers and as a land use i think is a really really valuable thing because it isn't going back the way it was so, so Peter's just right on that. I mean, even I mean, and it's it's a trend that long predated COVID, right? Stores that sell experiences were replacing stores that sell goods. Of course, COVID has derailed that. But uh, you know, 32 million Americans, one fifth of the employed labor force pre-COVID, worked in what you can call broadly the urban service sector. That's retail, trade, uh, leisure, and hospitality, right? If those, in some sense, the sort of permanent inflection occurs, if if this pandemic happens again, if there are new variants that break through the vaccines, if we get another another pandemic, then that whole sector, which employs vast numbers of less well-educated Britons as well as, as Americans, that whole sector is is at risk. And that, that really is the, the big danger moving forward. I want to take issue with something Philip said um, about overemphasizing mobility, which is he's entirely right that we have overemphasized the mobility of the rich. Right? We have not overemphasized the mobility of the poor at all. In fact, we have largely neglected the mobility of the poor, especially in the United States. And I am very worried that a focus on enabling upper middle income people to walk around in their nice little 15 minute neighborhood precludes the far larger issue, which is how, the, how do we make sure our cities once again become places of opportunity for everyone, right? Enormous inequalities in cities are only tolerable if cities fulfill their historic mission of turning poor people into rich people. I am only interested in urban planning concepts that fundamentally solve that, and I cannot see how the 15-minute city does anything on that. Thank you very much, Ed. We now need to do the final uh, round, and it's literally a sentence or two from uh, each of you, uh, and Isabel also fr from your end. Um, and I'd be really interested, building on what Ed just said, whether um, on overall, whether this issue of travel and transport intensity, let's measure it in the kilometers we travel on average per person per year, whether this is something, a measure which for the benefit of society should remain equal, should go up, should be reduced. And then of course, uh, the, the, any, any views on, on the, the equity issue, which Ed uh, just uh, uh, mentioned as well, whether there's any really important message for anyone working on the 15 minute city where there is a major mistake which can go wrong uh, not incorporating the equity domain. Let's start uh, with Peter, then Yulisa, Ed and Isabel. Very quick. So, I, so very quickly, I, I'm, I'm unconvinced about the 15 minute city and I'm unconvinced that I've seen many urban environments where it can be adapted in the near future. Uh, I think the volume of travel for work will decrease, but not by very much. And the volume of travel for leisure will increase. And I think the next question, as I was just saying, Philip, the next question for me is, what do you do with the decline of retail? That's the most pressing question in, in today's towns and cities, at least in Britain. Thank you. Thank you. Y you, Lisa? 
Um, Philip, I mean, f for me, it depends on where you're sitting on, on, on the food chain, right? Uh, if you are middle class or high income earner, you, it's possible. You can do your e-commerce sitting at, at, at the comfort of your house. You can do learning online, etc. But it's not really possible for the, the poor communities. So mobility and access to the city is still going to be a big thing. As I said in my introduction, it's a noble idea, but I'm not sure if we're there yet uh, in, in my case. I think an hour would be great and 45 minutes would be, would be excellent. Again, I mean, we have an opportunity to reevaluate where are we going to derive the most benefit it, depending on where we invest in terms of mobility, but mobility is extremely essential in my space. Otherwise, people can't thrive. Thank you. And Ed? 15 Minute City has two great concepts in it. They should be embraced. The idea of a 15 Minute City should be killed. The two great concepts are pedestrian walkable space, right, which is, which is absolutely what we need, and we should absolutely reclaim street space from cars and give them to ordinary people, allow us to walk on it. Secondly, embrace entrepreneurship, ground level entrepreneurship, both to reboot our, our economy post COVID and to enable the stores that sell experiences to replace the stores that sell goods. It is an appalling thing in the US that we regulate the entrepreneurship of the poor so much more strictly than we regulate the entrepreneurship of the rich because the rich innovate in cyberspace, which is largely a free zone. The poor actually you know, innovate in, in, in the ground, in real things. We must rethink those regulations. We must unleash the urban creativity that exists in every poor neighborhood as well as every rich neighborhood. And we must make sure that our cities work together as a whole rather than be separated and divided into enclaves. Thank you so much, Ed and Isabel. Uh, thanks very much, Philip. I mean, you asked the question about, you know, are, are we going to see more or less volume of movement? You know, thousands of years of human history tell us that people don't start moving less. You know, there's a fundamental desire. Whether we change our movement from work movement to leisure movement, there's a question. And what mode we're on. But the idea that people are going to move less because they're going to do things virtually, that has not been proven through, you know, many thousands of years of history. So we shouldn't be planning for that. We should be planning for, you know, things continuing as they are in terms of mobility being a key part of being human. Um, but I think that we need to use, and we don't have a choice but to use this moment in time as a moment of very significant radical change in the transport industry. The pressures around equity, whether you call it leveling up, you know, the rise of populist political movements, et cetera, combined with the climate and sustainable development push, which is now kind of really filtered into the, the mindset and to the corporate world, means that the old models, the business models and the ways of working are not going to be acceptable anymore and they already aren't but this is an industry that moves very very slowly so how do we find a way to move much faster in a much more agile way but use this point in time as a moment for radical change and i think that's really exciting for us as an industry and we need a lot of young dynamic people from non-traditional backgrounds to come into the industry uh, to do that so hopefully a lot of those people are on the chat that's great thank you so much uh, isabel so what's left is uh, to thank uh, our audience for joining us today, to thank our panelists for uh, an energetic uh, uh, sort of debate and uh, sharing opinions. I think it's very clear where uh, we all were sort of on the spectrum of the different uh, nuances of the 15-minute city and one-hour metropolis. I also want to thank Emily Cruz, Noah Powers and Jennifer Ho, who uh, made sure that this all worked and came together technically and logistically. And if you're interested, we have future events uh, on the Urban Age a debate series. The next one will focus on issues of culture. We'll then actually move to uh, the issue of shopping and retail as well. Uh, so do join us again. And finally, do contribute to our survey. We are running this at the moment for a few more weeks, the future of urban transport, speculations, opinions, but also views and uh, maybe advice what you would do if you had to advise government on where to put the money, what kind of regulation to roll out and what ultimately to hope for. Thank you very much, and uh, for now, uh, this uh, brings our debate to a conclusion.